thank you hugely for coming, especially on this gorgeous day when you could be walking or you know doing a little bit further on your own work. So I appreciate it tremendously that you've come out. Um, and yes, this is uh, sort of uh, the two parts of this. Uh, uh, this is the second part, um, how we can make coercion more legitimate. And I've got a succinct message, which is um, that the demand for legitimate coercion is increasing, just as its supply is decreasing. And yesterday I talked about the first part, how the demand is increasing, and today I'm going to talk about the second part, how supply is decreasing. And for sort of for those of you who weren't uh, there uh, yesterday, and also for sort of like a you know just so that when the test comes, you'll really know the answers. For those of you who were there yesterday, I'm kind of going to just just complete a little summarize for a second um, why we need more state coercion. I think I am. Whoops. Just a second. There's a little bit of a delay here. Oh, I see. It comes out here, but it doesn't come out here. So I'll just look at this rather than looking at that. So that's the, um, you know, that's the reason for this talk. And the misunderstanding there is that um, Reagan does not understand that whenever we uh, need free access goods, that's goods that once you produce them, anybody can use them, um, that creates a free rider problem, which creates the need for coercion. And in large anonymous societies, we're going to need state coercion in particular. That's the concept. And um, so what's a free access good? Just as I said, it's something that once you produce it, you can use it. Anyone can use it freely, like common defense or law and order, um, a, a non-toll road, stable climate, lots and lots of lots of things that um, are, are, if once you produce them, anybody can use them, whether or not they paid for it. That's the, that's the concept. And so if you can use it without paying for it, you're going to be tempted not to pay for it. Duh. Um, and if you, a lot of people are tempted not to pay for it, it's not going to happen. Or, and so, if we want it, we're going to have to coerce ourselves in some way. We're going to have to say to ourselves altogether, as Rousseau said, you know, okay, let's give a law to ourselves, and we'll tell ourselves that we're going to, we're going to pay for this. And if we don't pay for it, we're going to fine ourselves or do something that will create incentives so that we'll all now have incentive to contribute, and we'll be able to build the road or whatever it is. Um, now, you don't always need coercion. Sometimes you can use these other motivations, like solidarity and duty and so forth. But that doesn't cover the waterfront. And even when you use those, you're still going to need a lot of coercion. So why, Ronald Reagan, do we need government? Well, because we want need free access goods. Um, and of course, we can make lots of things free access goods. We can decide, as a collective, we're going to make health care something that, that people is just open to everyone. So the increasing need for state coercion comes from the fact that we're increasingly interdependent. So we need more things like emissions controls and law and order and so forth. And also, nature that we often, lots of free access goods like clean air that we often thought we could just like, hey, just have it. Um, we've kind of used it up and now we have to create it. As human beings, we have to get together and make sure that that air is clean or that that water is clean or there's enough water. So um, when you, I did a, ex, an exercise yesterday, and I would hope, and I, those of you who were present, I hope you'll use it in your classes. And so just uh, go out there and be missionaries, please, for the logic of free access goods. And here's a bumper sticker for you. <laughs> if you want to put this on your car, you just email me, and I will, I will uh, write away to some bumper sticker people and, and get this made as a bumper sticker. You can put it on and we'll start a social movement. Free access good. So nobody will understand what it means. I and actually then, made a bumper sticker that says, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, taxes are the price we pay for civilization. There you go. But that doesn't have free access. You're right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so that's, what, that's yesterday. So today I'm going to talk about um, the definition of, first I'm just going to define legitimacy, and then I'll say why the supply of legitimacy is decreasing, and then I'm going to say what can we do to make it increase, what can we do to make state coercion more legitimate, and then after I tell you everything I can think of, which will not be very many things, um, 
I'll say, is that enough? And the answer is very resoundingly no. Um, so that's the problem that we have, is that we've got some ways of trying to make the state more legitimate, state coercion more legitimate, but not enough. And um, so that's the, that's the kind of, that's the outline. And um, so here we go. So legitimacy is the right to make decisions that coerce. That's, that's all it is. And, um, Perceived legitimacy is what's doing all the work in um, producing a good and efficient government. It's if people perceive that they think, if they think that the law is legitimate, and a lot of sociology would just, in fact, a lot of writing, when it says legitimacy, it means perceived legitimacy, that people think the law is legitimate. And that's a very important thing, because when they think that the law is legitimate, they don't they're much more likely to follow it and so forth. So it's very important to get people to think that the law is legitimate. But in a good world, people thinking the law is legitimate would also be backed up by that there's good reasons for thinking the law is legitimate. It's not just that they're manipulated. So those two things are, are analytically separate, but um, they may often, and they should, in, in, the, in the best of worlds, they will always come coupled. I just want to distinguish, I'm not gonna make a big, deal of this difference. I just want you to kind of get it beforehand. And just make another point. When, when I'm talking about legitimacy, um, I'm talking about the process of making decisions, that you go along with the process of the decisions. It's not necessarily the decision uh, is, is in its outcome just. Um, because you can imagine something that went through a perfectly legitimate procedure, but the people made an unjust decision. Or you can imagine an autocrat or whatever and a perfectly illegitimate procedure making a just decision. They're different, and uh, we want both, both justice and legitimacy. I'm going to be talking about legitimacy. And if you ask where does legitimacy come from, normatively speaking, I have not written about this, and one of the reasons I haven't written about it is because what I would have to say is very boring. Um, and what I have to, the reason it's boring is it's just a list. Like, it, the way you kind of get people to remember what you have to say is if you have some wonderful thing, like imagine yourself in the original position, and then everything will flow from that. Um, my theory of legitimacy is a plural one. It says, yes, legitimacy comes from consent, giving a law to ourselves, but it also comes from a whole lot of other ways that procedures can be fair and people respected in the process and so forth. So it's a plural theory. Again, you don't have to know any of this to, to understand what comes next. I'm just filling you in on the kind of definitional background here. One thing that is absolutely critical for everybody in the room, though, to, to know, is that legitimacy, like almost all ideals, is a standard that you can't reach. And Kant's word for this, Immanuel Kant's word for this, is regulative ideal. A better word would be aspirational ideal, because that builds into the, into the language, the meaning of it. Um, that means you're never going to be able to reach it. You're never, so no government is able to, I, I studied a participatory democracy of only 41 people back in the late 60s. And, it, and they wanted democracy so much that they were giving seven hours a week to meetings in this one little 41 person workplace. And they did everything to try to make power equal. And they didn't succeed. The people who worked in the more central administration had more power than the people who were always out on the streets giving counseling to street people, just because they were, they were in a position structurally. And of course, the more middle class people had more power than the working class people and all that. But anyway, even if you try incredibly hard, you're never going to get to full legitimacy. Legitimacy is always a spectrum. So that means no act of coercion is ever fully legitimate. So the language that we use in everyday life, which is fine because we don't have to be super precise in everyday life, is that's legitimate, that's not legitimate. Whereas we should be talking about a spectrum of legitimacy. And if you see a speck of illegitimacy, it doesn't delegitimate the whole thing. That's the big point of, uh, that's the <coughs> thing to remember. So now I'm gonna get to the reasons why the supply of legitimacy is decreasing. And I'm going to start with um, the Middle Ages um, and uh, just this isn't really why, it's, why the supply of legitimacy is decreasing. 
it's why it's hard to get le legitimacy, period. And that's because our whole, not in our whole, oh, this is an exaggeration, a large part of our philosophical normative tradition has been uh, devised to, to um, try to stop tyranny. A very good thing to stop. Um, I, I'm no way against stopping tyranny. It's like, but we put a large number of eggs in that basket. So social contract theory and so forth, particularly the separation of powers in this country, all comes from this history of resistance to tyranny. Now my argument is that you can resist power and at the same time create power. And it's not all that easy. So yesterday we talked a little bit, I, a bit about the difficulties of having extrinsic motivation, that, you know, coming at you from the outside with coercion, and at the same time keeping up the great inside virtues of solidarity and so forth. It's a difficult thing to do. It requires attention and, and good design and so forth. But So here we have a tradition, and I'm going to just give you a little quotation from Manigold of Laudenbach, 1085, I did remember it. Um, and he was writing um, in Franconia. Um, I won't give you the context particularly, but he was writing against the Holy Roman Emperor, who uh, was at that time uh, having kind of a war with the Pope, and of course the monks <laughs> on the side of the Pope. Oh, wait a minute, I don't have a, uh, can you hear me in the back? You can't, okay, great. Um, so there he is, um, and this is what he wrote, because he was saying, this is the first written social contract theory, 1085, and he says, well, the, the, the people don't exalt the emperor above or a king above themselves. Note, it's the people doing it in order to grant him a free opportunity to exercise tyranny against them, but that he might defend them against the tyranny and unrighteousness of others. Yet when he who has been chosen by the people, the people chose him to do this, to coerce the wicked and defend the upright, has begun to do bad stuff himself, then is it not clear, this is a wonderful sort of semi-passive voice, that he deservedly falls from the dignity. It doesn't say what you should do if you're the people. It doesn't say you should kill him or throw him out. He just deservedly falls, like Umpty falls, Dumpty falls off the wall. He just deservedly falls from the dignity entrusted to them, and the people stand free from his lordship and subjection, because he was the first to break the compact for whose sake he was appointed. I mean, he's, he's just happened to have written it down. He didn't invent this. He was just, you know, there weren't too many people writing things down in 1085. There wasn't a lot of paper. There wasn't a lot of literacy. Um, there wasn't even a lot of ink. I mean, it was, writing something down was a big deal. So he, this, these ideas were completely out there. But he wrote them down. And this is the social contract theory. So it goes back um, as far as, um, oh, and then it's wonderful the, uh, the, the analogy he makes, because he says, you know, just think of, you know, like if you hired a swine herd to take care of your pigs and, they did, and the swine herd didn't take very good care of them, um, what would you do? Well, you'd reprove him and fire him. So the same thing with, with kings. Now, kings were often, you know, um, analogized to shepherds, but a swine herd is a, you know, there's a little sort of salty in there. Um, so, you know, so... Uh, Fast forward to the Federalist Papers, um, very, very much in this resistance tradition, and and you know in the U.S. we kind of make the Federalist Papers our Bible if we don't make the Constitution ourselves our Bible, um, and good uh, the resistance tradition I'm very much in it myself, um, but at the time that the Federalist Papers were written there was less need uh, to to prom to have uh, state coercion than there is now, because there was less need to have major free access goods. So that's the historical background. We are living, if we're, in, you, in those of you who are who've grown up in the U.S., and all of you now are living in the U.S., we're living in a place where the social contract tradition and the resistance tradition are big deals. But why is the supply of legitimacy decreasing? I think one thing is that state power has grown, you know, it's grown for perfectly good reasons. Namely, we've needed more and more state, more and more free access goods, so we've, in fact, had more and more state power. But as we have more and more state power, we should very reasonably have more and more resistance. You, you've got to have the two building up together at the same time. So we've, we're, we're particularly primed for resistance, and we've seen a ton of things hit learn. 
um, Tuskegee and, and currently, you know, the NASA, NSA spying and so forth. Um, that's one reason why we've seen decreasing legitimacy is we as citizens are, are more and more primed to watch out for state power as state power grows. The second is that, um, you know, for one reason or another, and Engelhardt and others will call it post-materialism, that, you know, Maslow's scale of needs, sort of once we've got our food and we've got our shelter and so forth and so on, um, we start looking, we start wanting other things, and now we want very, very, very legitimate government, thank you very much. And so we're putting the government under, under more scrutiny. You've seen the bunker stickers saying question authority. You haven't seen my bunker stickers saying, you know, create more coercion. Um, so this is, this is sort of the, you know, the, the mantra of our times. Uh, protest is now, as it should be, I think, you know, a completely legitimate um, method for citizens to express their, their, their um, uh, views one way or another. Um, at the time that I was first protesting, it was uh, considered a big deal. Now, 36% of the people and uh, adults in, in uh, Belgium say they've already they participated in the protest. So it's it's just a kind of way of expressing yourself in politics. But that's uh, Pepinaris's word is critical citizens. There's the norms have changed so that we are more critical, um, and that's I think by and large good. But it means that it, any legitimacy is very much more under scrutiny. And then finally, a, a less good reason, I think, which is that there are some interests, uh, um, the interests of the, the regulated, who, as a, as a large group, have an interest in getting the rest of us to be very, very skeptical of any regulation or any state power. Um, so there is a constant drumbeat of skepticism about any regulation and any state power. Um, and uh, it's against that that I want to speak. So I do think that the needs for resistance increase as our need for state uh, coercion increases. And also states, the second thing is not only does, do our citizenly needs for co state coercion increase, but the states get to be more and more sophisticated. I mean, they've got drones, they've got surveillance cameras on every, um, they've got ways of hacking everything. So the states themselves are getting, are, are becoming more capable as well as our needs for coercion. So we've got to do both these things at once. And that's not at all easy to do A and not A, at the, or A and anti-A at the same time. So, um, do good reasons explain all of why the distrust? I don't think so. I, I think there's that we have to be very wary of this drumbeat of anti-coercion. Uh, but you know, this is, you all know this, you may not have seen this particular graph, but you all know that trust in government, uh, this is trust government in Washington summer most of the time. Um, if you asked me, I think I would, I would, be, I would be a sum. Um, myself, uh, I do actually trust the government of Washington some of the time, um, so I would be on the yes of these. Um, but look how it's uh, deteriorated since '60. Uh, well, I think you all know that. Um, well, you know, it's not as if it's not as if there are no causes <laughs> uh, here. Um, these aren't particularly new causes. We have to explain a, a decline in time, um, but. Uh, there are some reasons why um, these things that might make, make you distrust government uh, have uh, gone up, so your trust in government should go down. Um, now I'm going to look at something that people on the left often don't look at, which is inefficiency. Um, and inefficiency has increased in the U.S. national government uh, because of polarization. Um, and I'm going to just show you some data on polarization. This is. Um, just a measure of polarization in the House and polarization in the Senate. Unfortunately, it's not a very easy measure to explain. It's the DW nominate score. Um, you can think of polarization in that. That's not, this is not this measure. This is a complex measure and a better measure than what I'm about to say. But you can think of polarization as the number of times uh, people 
or anti-polarization, anti the number of times people vote with others across the aisle. Polarization is the few people voting with others across the aisle very few times. So it's, a, it's even higher than back in the days of the robber barons, uh, when it was almost as high as it is now. And what are the reasons for that? My point is going to be that these reasons are structural and they're not going to go away. So when Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act in 64, over time he knew it was going to happen. He said, there goes the South, um, and it did. Uh, over time, the uh, white people uh, left the, uh, uh, a lot of, the sort of white conservatives left the Democratic Party and joined the Republicans, and that's a permanent shift in American politics. That will, that's just a given. Um, at the same time, since 1980, the parties have been very close. They have come, each of the parties has been within spitting distance of winning the election the next time. Now, strategically, I don't have the, I, I tried to keep the numbers of charts to a minimum, um, but if I'm going to talk about it, I guess I should have had a chart, but nevertheless. Um, strategically, if you think you're going to win, you're, you might win the election the next time, you're you have a lot of interest in keeping the majority party from doing anything. Because if they do anything, um, they can run on it next time. So you want to keep them not having anything to boast about. So your, your job as the minority party is to just completely block the majority party. And that's true whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Republicans, of course, have a little bit more incentive because they're the party of anti-change. but. But they still need some changes. Uh, they want to reduce the debt and things like that. Um, but their job is to keep the majority party from doing anything. So as long as you have electoral closeness, you're going to have a strategic uh, incentive for each of the parties to keep the other parties from doing anything. And then there's inequality. This here is the Piketty says income share U curve, which I think you probably all know. And you can see how very closely it maps onto the um, polarization. Now, correlation is not causation. Um, but we now, just it's an unpublished paper, we now know a little bit about the ca uh, causation. And let's see if I can, yes, OK. The causation is um, essentially out of district individual contributions. What happens is, um, rich people, who tend to be Republicans, start to invest in districts. So you can see it's gone up even just since 1990. They go for, naturally, places where there's a close vote. Where is there going to be a close vote? Where there will be a close vote is where a lot of voters are in the middle and could be voting for the Democrat, could be voting for the Republican. Um, that's where you're going to tend to see a moderate Democrat. So money rushes in. The Republican wins, and the moderate Democrat loses. Now, in you know a left-wing district in let's say, you know, uh, some place in Madison, you know, um, that's not going to happen. So, but so you, the Democratic districts are the ones that are sort of more solidly left. The moderate Republicans are done with, and the and the and the and within the Democrat within the Republican Party, the primaries are driving extremism. So those are the two. Um, and both of those things are money. Money's going into the primaries, causing extreme Republicans. Money's going into the uh, elections, causing the removal of moderate Democrats. And uh, even though there's a removal of moderate Democrats, basically you can see that um, within the Democratic Party, leaving the South <coughs> side, the move since um, this is 1939, that's FDR. Uh, the, this is on a liberal conservative scale. The Democrats have gotten more liberal, but nothing like the Republicans getting more conservative. Now, in the in the South, the um, in the sorry, in the South, uh, which is the dotted line, uh, uh, the da dotted. You see, in the Republicans, there's no difference between North and South. They're more conservative all the way. What happened in the South is if you take away the conservative Democrats, which are essentially the whites, what you're left with is, is you've got a black Democratic vote in the South. And, and African Americans are more likely to be liberal, more liberal than the standard, uh, the standard white Democrat. So you've got a, a South that's become much more liberal. 
but it's become more liberal not, not because people have changed their views, but because the people who call themselves Democrats are, diff are, um, are a, 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 a liberal subset of the earlier people. Does that make any sense? Okay. Um, so there's lots of suggested reforms to uh, polarization, like, um, mm -hmm. oh, you know, we could have better primaries, or we could have um, better districting, and so forth. But if you think about districting, just think, there's not much difference between polarization, if you remember those two lines, in the House and the Senate, you cannot redistrict the Senate. The Senate goes, the Senate line, the district lines are the state lines, and it's, gotten, it's just as polarized as the House. So these other things, really the only reform that could possibly affect polarization is campaign finance reform. And, uh, you know, we might get that. Um, I certainly give money to move to amend, but, you know, I think, I think it's probably unlikely. So you put that on top of a deep structure, which is the U.S. Constitution, which is designed to prevent tyranny, not necessarily to get things done. So it's designed to have all these veto points with the idea that only something that's absolutely in the general good will kind of get through all those veto points. That's the structure of the Constitution. Absolutely great if you're worried about tyranny. Not so great if you think there's a lot of stuff has to get through. So that's the structure, and this is the new normal. Uh, we've got, you know, we don't expect it to change. Um, so that's going to lead, the stalemate, it's going to lead to Ill inefficiency, which is going to lead to a loss of legitimacy. That's just totally predictable. And it's going to be, get worse rather than better. Um, so here is, um, tr this is just trust in politicians. It's not a legitimacy index, but it's a trust in politicians index, which is, um, and that's correlated with the efficiency. And you can see that the correlation is, is pretty uh, strong, that the more, the, the trust in politicians is actually higher in Singapore um, than it is um, even in Sweden. And Singapore doesn't even have, you know, a very good democracy, no opposition party. Um, but it's a very legitimate government from the point of view of perceived legitimacy. So if we think of this as perceived legitimacy here and efficiency here, it's, efficiency is a very good way of getting legitimacy, um, but it's also true that the causal arrow works both ways, that if you've got legitimacy, if you've got trust in government, if you've got a kind of a, a sort of a, a working thing where people feel they can trust their government, lots of things flow. People are more likely to obey the laws and so forth, and things go more efficiently. So it's not only that efficiency creates legitimacy, which I think it does. But legitimacy creates efficiency. There's a double causal arrow there if you want. You can see the United States is kind of somewhere in the middle there, a little bit better than India. And then, of course, there's a second effect of, of, illegitim of, uh, of inefficiency, which is that the stalemate then in Congress means that the executive has to take up the power, and the courts have to take up the power if anything's going to get done. Um, and that since the, the legislative <coughs> body is the main legitimating body. It's not that these are illegitimate bodies, it's just this creates a sort of sense of too much executive power, too much court power, um, and that creates a sense of illegitimacy. So, um, what about injustice? That's surely not new in the United States, um, but there's, you know, this massive amount of, poli of money in politics is new. Um, so, you know, you've got 76% uh, of Americans saying that um, the country's financial and political structures favor the rich. Um, and, and of the people who think that they never trust the government to do what's right, almost all of them think it's special interest money is a major problem. So, um, I'm going to look now at a, a table on corruption and, and uh, trust in government. But before I look at the table on trust, uh, corruption, I want to say that there are two types of corruption. One is illegal corruption, that you take money for doing some bad thing. Um, but then there's institutional corruption. That's Larry Lessig's phrase. Dennis Thompson invented it. Larry Lessig took it up. And that means some kind of the corruption in the in Machiavelli's old sense that it undermines the very core of, of what you're doing. It, it sort of eats away like acid. Uh, it corrupts. In the, in the almost physical sense. It uh, undermine, undermines the legitimacy. So here's, so 
ethics and corruption on this table is mostly the money under the table kind. And you can see again, Singapore and Sweden are very um, uncorrupt. Um, and the US is sort of, um, this is a fairly good measure. It's an index. I'm not going to bother you with all the components of the index, but it's not a bad measure. Um, US sort of in the middle there. So, um, so the more corrupt your country, not surprisingly, uh, the less legitimate uh, the government is uh, in a perceived uh, way. So that's, those are some of the, the causes. Um, and these are causes that are very hard to correct. I think um, that they're not entirely hard to correct. For example, we can make government more efficient. We can make government less corrupt. Um, neither of those things are causes of the left at the moment. Um, but, but what I'm suggesting is that for people concerned with social change, they're more important than you might have thought. Um, they're, they're deeply in there making government less legitimate. So how can we make state coercion uh, more uh, legitimate? Well, I want to look at what I call the chain of legitimacy, but I'm only going to look at the top and the bottom. Almost all work on legitimacy is, and I'm using that word academically, you know, that all that I put in the almost. It might be true that all the work on legitimacy <coughs> is about this level, the legislative level, how you make legitimate laws. Um, I'm going to talk about how we can, I'm going to spend most of my time on that. Um, but I also want to talk about legitimacy at the point of implementation, which I think actually we've got more chance of making better. Uh, than at the top. Um, but we ought to be working on both levels, I think. Um, so, at the top, um, well, anything we can do about campaign finance reform, fabulous. Okay, that's great. Um, you know, Transparency International, if they were to, it would just be wonderful if they were, they do a, a perceptions of corruption measure, which is it, criticizable, but as a first slash into the problem, it's not so bad. If they were actually to do the branches of the federal government, they would be very good. You know, it might turn out that these, I think if you looked at the federal government over time, you'd find that it was actually gotten less corrupt over time. That's not what people think out there in the broad fields of the republic, but I think, it, I think it's probably the case. Um, so it would be terrific if they would, we could get them involved in doing some measures in the United States. And then I think I'm a big fan of randomly selected citizens. I'm, I, I think uh, it could, if you, um, one of the things that a group of randomly selected citizens, and it really has to be a couple of hundred to have any, any be able to hold up its head as a, a genuine random sample. And you also have to really, really pay the poor people to come and you have to pay the people who don't speak English to come, and you have to pay the people who normally would, would fall out of a self-selected group. You have to make incredible efforts to get those folks to come. But if you do that, then, and you have them talk together about policies, then what they come out with could have some weight if the American public ever got used to the whole idea of a random sample. So for example, in Italy, and that could give cover for for moderate legislators to, to do certain things. So for example, if you had a really good, well done uh, deliberative poll, a well done random sample, this is what happened in Italy, they had in Rome, they, they had too many hospital beds. So they really needed to close some hospitals, but no, no politician would dare to come out because each district didn't want the hospital to be closed in that district. So nobody would know. So they got together a group of citizens talked about it for a weekend, you know, they, they had um, the different advocacy groups uh, present, got together and got balanced materials that they all agreed on. They had experts from both sides that the citizens could question and so forth. After a weekend, the citizens decided that some of the hospitals should be closed and these should be the criteria for closing them. And then the politician said, yes, that's a good idea. And you see, the citizens decided it. So I think that you could 
use, or for example, we know how referenda, which was a terrific progressive idea, give the power to the people. We know how that's gone south, you know, gone sour in California. Well, what if you had a citizens group that, that, that now they, they have this now in, um, in Oregon, not a really good random sample, a much smaller group, but still, it's had an effect on, on the referenda in Oregon. They have a citizens group to deliberate over these things and make and give advice to their uh, the other citizens. Um, so you could have, or you could have primaries. You could have a deliberative citizen group look at all you know the candidates in the Democratic Party or candidates for whatever, candidates for school board, and question them, and then and then come out with the pros and cons and so forth, or, or if not pick one. So I'm a big fan of the lot, only because I think, not because I, only because it's something has to be done, you know. Um, and I think um, descriptive representation in the United States, that is to say women represent, more having more women in the legislature, having more blacks in the legislature, having more Hispanic, Latinos in the legislature, um, that, that's fine, but we don't have a very good way of, of producing it in the U.S. because we've got single member districts with first past the post system. Very hard to get um, descriptive representation uh, on purpose that way. Similarly, decentralization, I think we would do very well to give more power to the cities. Joel Rogers is working on this, but you know, I mean, none of us can, can change the structures that keep the power from the cities. Um, maybe negotiation, and I will talk about that in a minute. Um, in Europe, they're in a much better situation, partly because, we, because of the EU and because of the new countries in Europe, everybody's in a constitution-making mode. You say to Americans, you know, maybe we should have a little bit less separation of powers in the U.S. People say, this is the best constitution in the whole world. We've had it for longer than almost anybody. We love it. We're never going to change it. In Europe, they're up for a little uh, stuff. Very, very low corruption in the Nordic states. Um, they've got a lot of a lot of the states have got pro proportional representation. If you've got proportional representation, descriptive representation is fairly easy. Let's say migrants. You decide. You could just decide to put you know 10% migrants, people from not not you know from another country on your list because it's a proportional representation list system. So you've got your this is the municipalization in in. Uh, that's a kind of decentralization that's more power to the cities, but the cities then take over large uh, areas. That Denmark was already on the very, very high. Right, how sad it is a euro barometer question. How satisfied are you with the way democracy works in this country? It was already in the mid 80s. They put in the municipalization. 94% say they're at least somewhat satisfied. It's way more than the rest of Europe. This is doable in Europe. You can actually get to a legitimate polity. Um, and they've also institutionalized negotiation, which I'm going to get to. So um, this is meliorative. I am not at all saying that this is going to have a huge amount of effect, but you go for what you can. This is um, the reason the A is just supposed to be a hand here. Um, this is the book that came out of um, while Eric was doing the God's work. I was trying to, I was doing, you know, not, not the devil's work, but I was very much so trying to make things a teeny bit better to try to do political. So Brookings is going to come out. This, if, if you want to read anything about this, go to the American Political Science website within, you know, within the month because it's going to come out as a Brookings book, and when it is, the free copy is going to be taken, the free access good will be taken away. Um, and so this is what we say, that... Um, that you're going to get more successful negotiation. Now, negotiation is really good in a polarized situation because enemies can negotiate. It's only about, you don't have to be nice. It's helpful to be nice, but. So why do negotiations often fail? Because of self-serving bias and fixed pie bias. Self-serving bias is pretty obvious. More than 50% of people in the United States think that they're better than average drivers. More than 50% think that they're better than average ethically. More than 50% think that they're better than average in almost every good thing. That's because we human beings are optimistic. Pessimists um, are more accurate. People who are depressed are more accurate about their 
analyses in the world. This is a, this is this has been shown in social psychological experiments. Most of us are just a little bit of self-servingly accurate, uh, you know, unaccurate, and that's probably why we keep going in the world. Uh, it's probably functional, but it's not great for for negotiation because each party comes in thinking, you know, that, that they're going to get a better deal than they than is actually likely. And fixed pot bias. I'm going to give you an example of this. Here's the thing that they gave to MBA students. You got a, a, a guy wants to sell his gas station, but he can't sell it for less than 500,000. You got a guy who wants to buy it, he can't buy it for more than 400,000. No deal, right? But in, in the materials of this case, it turns out that why is he selling the station? His wife's sick, they've always wanted to sail around the world. He wants to sell the station, buy a yacht, they're gonna take a year. She's, she's failing, they're going to come back. And then what? What is he going to do afterwards? He doesn't really know. He'll try to get some sort of job. Well, it turns out that the, sell, the person who wants to buy it can say, how about $400,000 and I'll give you a job when you come back in a year managing the station. Well, that's something that, was, that you're bringing another issue in. And the key to a successful negotiation is bringing new issues in in which you can negotiate um, and sometimes uh, it's a relatively no cost to one side to give something that's valuable to the other side. But if you bring in lots and lots of issues, you can trade on things that are low value to, to, to one and high value to the other. Mm -hmm. So only about 39% in the, this experiment could make this deal. But then they gave the other group these instructions to take the perspective of the other to the seller, try to understand what he's thinking what his interests and purposes are in selling the station. These are both males. Uh, try to imagine what you'd be thinking in that role. Two lousy sentences, two sentences, two sentences. 79% made the deal after getting two sentences of instruction. So the point here is that all of us can use a little help in moving from fixed pie bias to, uh, to a, a broader a broader view. <coughs> Oops. And um, how do we get that to happen in our legislator, legislatures? Well, some things that you might not like to hear. Um, people who've been in the legislature longer um, are, not surprisingly, more able to see things from the perspective of lots of other people in the legislature because they've dealt with them on different issues. Sometimes they'll actually have been allies, not so much anymore because of polarization, but sometimes they might have been allies on one issue. And they begin, you know, they understand the other person's constituency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that long incumbency leads to good negotiation. If you think who are the great negotiators in the U.S. Congress, there are always people who've been there for a long time. Privacy. You can't do a negotiation in public. We, th that doesn't even need any explanation. Uh, it means that you, you'll you say things like stuff about your wife. You, you might not, lots of pieces of information that would be very helpful in a negotiation. Um, you are not going to say necessarily say in public. You might, you might say, I understand your perspective. Somebody reports that back to your constituency, oh my god, understands the other's perspective very bad. So you've got to have privacy. Side payments, that's very, all of these things um, are very uh, sort of problematic uh, from the point of view of classic democratic norms. Um, because we think contest and turnover, that's really democratic. We think transparency. Uh, if you look at, take a Google Ngram thing, the word transparency has just soared in the last uh, uh, 15 years. Um, side payments, shouldn't we be for the common good? These are things, all of these things that make for good negotiation um, are things that um, are, haven't been thought to be very democratically acceptable. So I got a bunch of normative theorists together and people, analyze this from the point of view of conditions and say, well, when, when would it be okay to have long incumbencies? When would it be okay to go behind closed doors? When would it be okay to make side payments? And we have a long little list under each of those. But basically, you know, when, when would it be okay for you? You can imagine, mm -hmm. supposing you're in the union and your union representative goes behind closed doors to negotiate. When is that okay with you? 
but you can trust the person behind closed doors. It's fine. It's, it'll be fine with you if you can trust them. The problem is, um, that's a little circular. Sort of, if you can trust them, you've already got the legitimacy you're trying to create with the efficiency you're going to get with negotiation. But luckily, actually, in the U.S., a lot of people do trust their actual representative. They just don't trust the Congress. So, so um, I think that in political science, for example, we don't teach that long incumbencies, privacy, um, and side payments are good things. Um, nor do you get see this in the newspaper, but um, maybe we, if, we, if we were able to see, in Europe a ton goes on through this negotiation. You know, a, a lot, uh, because you've got institutionalized workers' parties, you've got institutionalized business, you've got peak associations in either case. They make, they negotiate things, and then often the legislature just says, fine, we're going to take that wage settlement and, and, and turn it into law. That's almost illegal in the U.S. Uh, 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 politics. So I think we've got a long way to go on negotiation. Um, we could get so, so to, just to summarize, we could get transparency. These are these are not going to solve the problem, but they're all I can come up with. Um, the, but overall, if we were all to start thinking more about how do we make coercion legitimate, maybe you guys could come up with some stuff that I haven't come up with. If we could get more of us thinking about this problem, I think we would be uh, uh, better off. So um, now I'm going to look to the bottom um, and go to, um, just go to Peel's Principles of, of Policing. Uh, Robert Peel, who kind of began the British Bobbies. They're called Bobbies because Robert Peel, Bob, Robert Peel. Um, and this is his seventh principle. The police are the public, and the public are the police. This is a very good normative aim. Um, we should make more of it. Now, if you're going, to, if the police are going to be the public, and the public are going to be the police, the police sort of have to look a little bit like the public. So they, the police, can't look like this. They need to look more like this. Um, this. This is, these are both scenes from Ferguson. Um, and now, in fact, Captain Ronald Johnson was actually told to join the protesters. I was very sad when I heard that. Um, it wasn't that he decided himself to do it. But in a good system, he would have been, he would have been the head of chief of police in Ferguson. He wouldn't have just been some state trooper they pulled in, not state trooper, just you, because he captain. A guy they pulled in from central casting, so to speak, to when they needed it. In a good system, he would have actually been the police chief, and he would have been coming up with these ideas himself. Um, and we should be thinking about how to create incentives for street-level bureaucrats to be representatives of the public to the public. That should be our goal. I've never heard anybody even enunciate that as a norm. But if you're going to have a legitimate coercion, it has to be from us to us, which means that the bureaucrats themselves have to be, to some degree, represent the public. Um, and when we think about making them accountable, we should be thinking not just of monitoring them and sanctioning them, but, as, but of expecting them to give an account, to give an explanation. I was talking with the, it was, uh, I forgot the name. De Devon, yeah. Devon yesterday about, about the old meaning of of giving an account, Ron Dracon, the same thing in German and French. And this is from <coughs> the Oxford English Dictionary. This is their, if you just look at the Oxford English Dictionary right now, today, this is how they define it. To give an account of, to answer for, to, to, narr to narratively explain um, one way, uh, or two way to actually enter into a discussion about, well, maybe if you don't think now, of course you can't expect every cop on the beat to serve, have a whole little seminar about whether the law, da 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 da, but there ought to be some opportunity for the community to get together with the police, like the Ten Point Coalition and what was it. So, so that it was, public hearings are not necessarily the most deliberative space. So we might uh, try to figure out some other places where there could really be this accountability in the giving account sense. And I think that on the bottom there is more hope 
Um, I think I, there's already underway a number of police reforms. If we had this norm of we might be able to see more. You could use, again, a lot in lots of places. You could maybe get people to, to be used to a lot by, if, if you imagine every high school had an elected student government and a student government elected by lot, both of them, like two chambers. And one of them had the fall prom and the other had the spring prom. Um, and you'd get them in kind of competition, you'd be able to see. We don't know what lot does. We don't know which the student body would identify with more. We don't know whether maybe the kids would just act out the ones who are chosen by lot, but maybe they wouldn't. Maybe they'd come up with some neat original ideas, and we could begin to we could be to legitimize the lot. Um, Robert Dahl suggested having a third legislative chamber in a federal level elected by the lot, but you could have that in the states. We talked about more power in the cities, participatory budgeting. You know. <coughs> a great deal about here already. Um, maybe the Transparency International Index could be used for cities and states. It would be great if we had a set of indices for, for good government in the states. Governance, you know, and good government, it's not a left issue. In fact, if you say governance, it's one of these things where most people on the left say, ah, you know. But actually, I think it is our issue. I think if we think of it through this legitimacy lens, we do want to have good go governance. And if we had some sort of race to the top on these issues, it would be terrific. So is this enough, these things? Are you kidding? They're poetry. I don't think they're enough at all. And that's where you guys come in. So you can get into a descending spiral of, illegi of illegitimacy where people think the government's Ill Ill illegitimate so that we'll take you know, just take the Department of Motor Vehicles. You know, you don't fund the, the, them appropriately. That means they're long lines. That means people, that means citizens say government doesn't work. That means the next time the citizens want their taxes to go down because government doesn't work. It should all be gone. So it's, you can have this kind of descending spiral or you could possibly have an ascending spiral of legitimacy where if things were, if government was working, if it was efficient, if it was working well, then people, and you could see this in places like Sweden, you know, or Denmark. You ask Danish citizens if they might mind paying more than half their income in, you know, GDP and tax, I mean, uh, in taxes, more half than half their income. No, they love it. They say because they're getting, they're, they're getting all this stuff and they've, they've got this feeling of society that they're wanting to support. So you could get into an ascending spiral. So there you go. That's my bottom line. Our need for legitimate coercion is increasing for the reasons I spoke of yesterday and our supply is decreasing and it's an urgent problem. So thank you. Yes, please. So I agreed with the, with the talk you gave yesterday, um, almost everything. In fact, I've been giving that lecture to my own class for the past month, and talking about climate change and sociology. Um, but I heard the word almost. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> agree the enclosure movement increased efficiency, actually. But that, yeah, that the enclosure movement increased yes. efficiency, but that's really a slight mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. But what you've said today, I think, really highlights one of the problems with, with the way that you uh, are appro approach things yesterday, which is that, so I think the most operative part of your talk about increasing legitimacy, uh, increasing legitimate authority, we, we can just call it once again, is the part about restoring the old congressional system, restoring the, 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 the Tip O'Neill days when, when legislators could make deals, etc. I think a lot of the other well, things. Well, when you say restoring the old congressional yeah. system, there are many parts to the quote unquote old yeah. congressional system, and I wouldn't just restore it, push a button, and bing no, back to day yeah. one. But I think that part of what you're talking about is going back in a way to the to the way. Well, that what I would work. restore is I would if I could put if I could push said button, <laughs> I would make commit committee hearings private and subcommittee hearings private. Um, so that's that's one thing I would do. But there are many many things that I wouldn't do. But you know, but I, that's one thing I would do. So when you talked yesterday, to, when the when the idea of the example of a road was brought up, so a road is a is a free access good, whose value is dramatically different for different people. Yes, it's much greater for people with cars 
than for people without cars. It's much, much greater for people who own trucking companies than for people with cars and so on. And to the degree that the old American political system did work better in both creating and preserving free access goods, it did so very much on the basis that we're going to, we're again going to do it in such a way that it, it looks like everybody's benefiting, and everyone is benefiting a little bit, but, but somebody it's, very, is benefiting easy. A it's lot. very easy, especially behind closed doors, especially with minimal trans transparency, especially with an entrenched political elite that is in dialogue, not just with each other, but uh, the entire system involves constant dialogue with the entrenched business elite, right? It's very, very easy to sell, even somewhat accurately, these things as being for everyone's good when you, in fact, radically differentiate the amount of good that's there. And part of what's going on, and, and I agree that there's a real problem with the collapse of legitimate authority, part of what's going on is that there are enough people who are tired of that and who, who have a sense that even if you're going, giving them something, you're giving the rich much more. So I think that in a way, today's talk is just, is, it, it seems, the approach seems just, uh, First of all, very parochial com compared to the scale of the problem that you're talking about, and secondly, it, it seems uh, it, it seems too much backward looking. I mean, if we're going to talk about global commons that are of fundamental import importance, like you know a, a relatively carbon dioxide free atmosphere, then we need to reinvent this on a new basis, and we need to make some of these these questions clear and we need to create a political process that can preserve legitimacy while also injecting a kind of equality that wasn't there before. Yes, I completely agree with those goals. Um, and I also completely agree with your point that um, deals tend to benefit the people with power in the, in the deal room. Um, and so you know, we can all sort of wish for a, a better era, um, and a better era for me would be one in which labor was much more powerful and could <clears throat> could exert a countervailing effect. So I think there are many ways of achieving good negotiations, um, and I don't think transparency is the only way. And one way is to have people in the room who are going to be, let's take, if we're, if we're thinking um, the trucking industry, there's the, the people who own the trucks, and then there's also the drivers, um, and then there's the, the, pe the, the, the people who you know, are, are being hurt by the emissions from the, from the vehicles. And often those three parts are not in that room with equal weight. So we Definitely, and then this this normative group that I that I convened is very strong on this. And Habermas, who's, who used to be very 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 much against negotiation, has now come around. And I think everybody agrees that a better you know that normatively speaking, sort of the only perfectly good negotiation is one in which all the parties that are going to be affected are are represented. And then we get a little bit of a normative problem, either equally or in proportion to the amount they're affected. It's not 100% clear which is the normative goal that you want here. But in either case, that's not, the, not what we've had. Um, so rather than saying, um, I, I want to go back, which I don't, if, if, we're, if we're trying to think of what would be a good system, I think a good system would be one not that was totally transparent, but one that where behind the doors you had an appropriate representation of interests. And that's what we should be working for. Whereas I, I think it's much, much easier in our resistance tradition to just say transparency, transparency. Because that's so simple. Everybody's kind of for transparency. And, but that's, I don't think actually that's where we want to. I, <clears throat> maybe it's better to have transparency than have, you know, a, a really bad, bad deal with where it's being run by just the rich people. But what we should be working for, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get our, what we should be working for straight. And what we should be working for, I think, is someplace where the deal makers, and it, it, this is not, 
this is to some degree, and I don't want to exaggerate it, but more, much more than in the United States, Europe is, in, is, is further along, and you know, Sweden is further along, Denmark is further along, even the EU is further along in this regard than, than we are. It's not just, the, it's not even just labor and um, business, because then the, then the general public is not represented. You've got to have <clears throat> at least those three, and maybe maybe more too. What about you know? What about people outside of your country? I mean, you really have to be thinking about who should, how to, and how to represent those interests. It's not necessary that necessary that absolutely everybody have a person. There are other ways of getting interests <coughs> represented, but that's what we should be after. And I completely agree with you. It's just I think that by the, the our present stance, which is transparency isn't the way to get there. And I also would not push a button and just go back. That I don't consider the old days the, the wonderful days. I'm just saying transparency is not the answer, in my view. So, so I love both talks, just to be really clear. And I particularly love the sort of emphasis on the way the free writer problem gets translated into politics in ways that create a downward spiral. But I don't totally understand how, given that the problem that you set up was global, as in the free rider problem was global, and particularly with the rise of multinational corporations that are crossing borders and race to the bottom stuff and so on, how you get to global coercion. I actually thought when you said the supply of legitimate coercion is decreasing, and I was expecting you to talk about the problem of how sovereignty interferes with any ability to regulate corporations across borders. And I wondered if you had anything yeah. to help me with there, because yeah. Yeah. I really um, need help. <laughs> well, you know, it's, as we said, spoke about yesterday, uh, the global situation is a tough one. Um, but I think if we keep our eye on free access goods and the need for coercion, we may find it easier to swallow some losses in sovereignty. Um, we're going to have losses in sovereignty, and the question is, can we do that move better or worse? And what should we be trying to keep our eye on? We should be trying to keep our eye on having interests relatively fairly represented in the behind-the-doors negotiations that are going to have to take place, because we don't even have the structure that we have um, you know, and, and within nation states, we have a, you know, a much more ramshackle structure in which um, those who have power uh, can find it even easier to dominate because um, they're not constrained by existing structures that have been set up to, in part to constrain them. Um, so the question is how do we, you know, how do we do that? Your guess is as good as mine. But as we go forward, I think we're going to have to um, swallow some losses, some losses in sovereignty, some losses in, in, our, in our ideals. I mean, you know, getting, getting a little curb on global warming is, is going to be worth a lot. And it may be worth, you know, swallowing some of our anger at the inequalities that are going to be are going to be written in, because we know what happens when powerful people get together, and un, and less powerful people get together, the powerful people win. I mean, so that whatever deal comes out of anything that's moving us to global warming, one thing that's absolutely predictable is that it will benefit the rich more than the poor. I mean, that's completely predictable. However, there are already structures in which we can try to raise the power of the poor in, in these negotiations. There are already those, and the more we can support those, the better. I mean, there are, for example, you know, some deliberative stuff that, you know, the people in Australia are doing. There's um, the attempt to have, um, you know, the islands that are being um, swallowed by the oceans uh, to give them particular representatives from those islands, particular weight. They're not, they wouldn't have any weight from a population perspective. They wouldn't have any weight from a power, from a geopolitical power perspective. But they have weight from the fact that they're being deeply affected. Their very life existence is in. So, mm -hmm. so normatively as a, as a, as a 
globally, I think as a, as a, as a, as a global polity, we're beginning to um, agree that those islands should have more than proportional representation. So there's, there are steps in the way of, of putting curbs, but uh, we're, we're way, way, <laughs> for, and I think we're just, you know, if we're going to get, we're going to have to swallow some illegitimacy in the way of, of greater power. But while working to get, that, that's what I mean about trying to do the two things at the same time, try to fight the the inequalities that we see and the and the excess of power that we see, but at the same time keep trying to build uh, the structures of coercion that so we're going to need. So the thing that I see globally that's really hard is what you said earlier, I don't remember it was yesterday or today, about how if people perceive corruption, the more they think other people are free riding or corrupt, the less likely they are to participate themselves. Yeah. In a highly unequal global setting, where poor countries feel like powerful countries are ripping them off and have been doing stuff that are incredibly polluting, they're really unwilling to make changes yes. themselves. And I, I don't see how you get past that. Because it, by definition, I have those no inequalities are I don't how to get past that. Um, I think that um, as we move down this pike, if more people were to kind of adopt the language that I'm suggesting, um, I, I think you might even be able to, you know, s sort of sell some deal where, you know, go, going back to the negotiation, there might be, if, if, if you could, if you could realize that you can negotiate with enemies, that, that you don't have to like, you don't have to be on the same side with the person. You can be at completely opposite sides, like the ga this gas station seller, uh, oh, buyer seller. They didn't know each other. They didn't care for each other. They could drop dead as far as they were concerned. Um, all each of them wanted to do was make money. That's all they wanted to do. But they, by listening to one another, they could make a deal. And that's what a lot of people kind of don't get, that you can actually move forward um, at, by trading on things mm -hmm. that are low, high value, and so forth, um, bringing in other issues. You can move forward even if you're enemies. And I think many, many people don't sort of understand that. They think that sort of the, the rich countries are sort of so evil, they're not going to enter a negotiating room with them. Um, and it's important to make sure that when they enter that negotiating room, there's some protections for them. That, and then they know that. And so it's, so they're, but, it's still possible for, for there to be forward movement. And I think that's, and then if you can get some forward movement, then you can be, maybe begin to build some trust if you have the right kinds of protections. And maybe you can even put protections in if you can, um, you know, convince the rich people that to some degree, it's to their interest also to have some protections, um, like rights, for example. Uh, you know, that's how rights happened. Um, the, Sort of the the powerful people in the world are constrained by by a whole a whole slew of rights and constitutions, but um, most constitutions in the world have got lots and lots of rights in them. And many countries, um, even those rights, even have bite. Um, and it's been a long struggle. I mean, that's that's something that's happened over time, but it's has mm. happened. Eric, I really like the um, coupling of the spiral of delegitimation with a hypothesized by ascending spiral. Uh, we know that there was a deliberate strategy behind the delegitimation strategy. You know, Norbert, you know, Grover. Grover, Norquist's famous Star of the Beast, uh, is, a, is precisely that downward spiral. And it's clear that dismantling a, a good equilibrium is fundamentally an easier task Destroying is easier than building. Destroying trust is always easier than creating it. So the question is, what's the, what's a plausible actual strategy of ascent? I mean, is it so? One vision is that what you have to do is really take seriously the start local. You have to do start what? local. Start so locally. That's yeah. That's so that, that was my really suggestion. In cities, which, <coughs> where um, there's way more play to do something. But the premise then is that that creates a platform in which more can be done later, as opposed to that's a new equilibrium. Now maybe it's okay, it's a better equilibrium to have a little bit better trust at the level of cities where you can do a little bit more, even if it doesn't spiral up to higher levels of the system. Okay. Um, what's a little harder to see is 
exactly how you get a dynamic launched from the low that actually spirals up, as opposed yeah. to moves up a little bit. And, and then stuck. stays still, gets into yeah, a I don't, you stasis. Know, the, the, the logic of the dynamic up is way less clear than the logic of the dynamic down. <laughs> I'll tell you, you're right. Uh, yes, absolutely. And, um, and so even in principle, I mean, I don't mean in the practical sense of, you know, can we mobilize the forces to do it? I just mean even the kind of logic of spiraling up isn't as clear for these reasons. Yes, I, I think that's right. And everybody knows that even interpersonally, I mean, even just between two people, let's forget the globe, that it takes a long time to build up trust and it can be broken with one act. And then it's then it takes a great deal of time to, you know, so the descent is simple and the ascent is, is hard. So start locally, you know, and, and then there's just luck. I mean, we just have to sort of pray for some luck. Um, you, you never, nobody predicted the civil rights movement, nobody predicted the feminist movement, nobody predicted the environmental movement. Nobody predicted this pope. You know, did somebody predict the? This pope. Nobody this predicted pope. this pope. Nobody, nobody predicted this pope. <laughs> Right, so there, there are moments when possibly an ascending thing can go, but my hope is that if, if we begin to sort of understand the logic of it, and, and in particular on the left, you know, we're into a little bit of a knee-jerk resistance tradition, you know, a little bit of a kind of tear it down, and maybe not, maybe not here in Wisconsin, because here in Wisconsin, you know, you've got to build up, that's, that's the beauty of, of the this area and some other areas, is it's that these areas know what it's like to actually create governments that are legitimate governments and that get things done. That's not so, so much the case. may be wrong, but we agree with the spirit. That's right, yeah. the spirit. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I toss it back to you. I think that if, if you pose that as, a, as the problem, then human thinking may help us muddle through to an answer. Uh, I don't have the answer, uh, I, but I, I want to pose the problem in as clear terms as I can. I was wondering, I haven't heard your talk yesterday as well, why you chose to couch all of this in terms of coercion. Why I chose? To couch ah, because it's discussion hard. in terms of coercion. Coercion is a hard sell. It is a hard sell. Society with a liberal tradition. Totally. Especially your effective equation of government with coercion. Yeah. I, I found. I, at least it, it, it may be only a question really of marketing, but I'm not. I'm, yeah. Perhaps there are other concepts like government capacity or right, right, right. governance capacity yeah. or something. Well, like I that. thought it was analytically clearer to talk about coercion. Um, so I'm, I'm into analytic clarity. Um, and I think that government capacity, um, there's lots and lots of ways of getting government capacity and we're all for good stuff. I, what I wanted us to do was bite the bullet. I mean, nobody's for coercion. Well, coercion is lack of freedom. I mean, coercion is making you do something you don't want to do. That cannot be a, something anybody likes. I mean, that's, I mean, maybe a sadist or something like that, but you know, you're, you're basically, also basically, the, also oh, by definition, the, coercion is something also we don't diminish the concept of what government is about, the understanding of what government yeah. is about. Yeah, uh, what, you know, there are lots of very wonderful things that government, governments can coordinate, you know, um, I mean, a, mm -hmm. a lot comes just through coordination. Um, <coughs> a lot comes through moral, a moral stance. Think about Brown v. Board. Of course, that was a this you know that was the judicial branch of government, but still, um, the the original thing was coercion, but the the overall effect was a, a moral change um, in in many people as they grew up in the South. Um, so, I, I'm in no way saying this is that coercion is the only thing. I'm saying coercion is the hardest thing to swallow. It's it's the hardest bullet to bite. And I and I want I want to get to that and and um, you know and sort of strip it raw and and get people not fooling themselves that this is an important part of government. I'm not saying it's the whole thing. I, and I think I had a, a sentence somewhere or other that a couple sentences in the first lecture that said 
it, no, it's not the whole thing, but I think it's the hardest thing to swallow because coercion is, by definition, bad. Coercion means not being able to do what you want to do. You're being forced, either threat of sanction or, or force, to do something that you don't want to do. That's, that's by definition, a bad, you know. So what I'm saying is we've got to see that this bad thing is, is, can be made a good thing by our coercing ourselves. And that's, you know, a, a tough, a tough, apple to swallow or whatever, I don't know what the right metaphor is, but I'm uh, biting bullets all over the place and swallowing things. And, but um, I want, I want but whatever, the, whatever the metaphor well, is, well, I want well, us well, to... Well, whether linguistically it's necessary to go <laughs> So, but, but you see what I'm, I'm doing. I'm trying to get us not to paper over the fact that, that this is not a pleasant thing. It, it becomes, it can, we can legitimate by doing it to ourselves, we, and by, by coercing ourselves, as Rousseau said way back in the day. Um, but, so, that's, so that's why I'm using the word, is to kind of, because I think it's analytically clearer. Um, there, this gentleman, and then you. Um, I was just curious about, so when you're talking about the Ferguson, um, yep. examples, yep. kind of specifically examining on that. Uh, this idea of descriptive representation in the different parts and how that builds legitimacy. So I'm interested in the wake of more current events, so like race can be a descriptor, gender can be a descriptor. There's other things that people identify with. How would you set that up or like how, what do you think about that as far as class, your geo, like your religious beliefs, like seeing that reflected as a descriptor in the legitimacy that that builds? Like yeah. what do you think about how those different categories Great. Um, I'm glad you asked that question, as they say, um, because I've written about this. Uh, I wrote back in 99, I wrote a, an article called um, Should Blacks Represent Blacks and Women Represent Women? A Contingent Yes. And what I argued was that descriptive representation is important for legitimacy in some contexts, but not, in other, not so much in others. And that because there are costs to, to privileging descriptive representation, to making extra efforts to get, like we don't worry about the descriptive representation of tons of things because just by random accident, they, you know, the, the legislatures have them already. I mean, I just imagine there's many left-handers in the Senate as in the population and so forth and so on. There's no, you know, there's nothing biased or whatever going, going on here. So when, when you get, a, a, a problem of non-descriptive representation, non-proportional representation, if there are any costs to getting it, when should you pay those costs? And I argue that um, in so, if there are uncrystallized interests, this is on the lawmaking level now, if, uh, if there are uncrystallized interests, and the example I use is the Anita Hill hearing, mm -hmm. um, the Clarence Thomas hearing, in which um, it was before sexual harassment had become a, a kind of a word that many, most people in the U.S. even knew. Um, the women from the House of Representatives, there's a famous picture of them charging up the Senate steps to insist that Anita Hill get her hearing. Uh, seven women. Women. Why women? Because this was an uncrystallized issue. Nobody had run for office on these issues. Um, but they, through their experience, sort of said, OMG, this is, this is really a big, you know, this is a problem, this is terrible, we've got to do something about it. Cause similarly, if minors or, you know, if the far people with a farming background or, you know, whatever it might be, people from the southern part of the country, people from the northern part of the country, they're more sensitive, they've lived through with their experience, these issues. So you raise class, and I just wrote, um, um, I was asked by the Swiss Journal of Political Science to write something called should workers represent workers? Um, and that's the title of the article. <laughs> and I say that none of the three contingencies that I wrote about for blacks and women apply in the case of workers. The, the, the interests have been crystallized since Aristotle. The, the sort of issues of poor versus rich have been the stuff of politics, um, not precisely the worker capital, you know, not, not, not 
not, not a fully developed capitalist capital analysis, but work, rich and poor anyway. Um, and uh, some of the others were history of, of, of uh, a history of communicative distrust, which is very true for blacks and, and whites in the U.S. And so blacks will contact a black member of the legislature far more than they'll contact a white member of the legislature because of this huge history of communicative distrust in the U.S. Um, not so true, not quite so true with the workers. Partly because some workers grow up to be middle class, and some middle class people turn out to be working class, and so there's more com more communicative. Um, anyway, um, so I say there. Well, you know, the, if you had all the unions and and political parties that were class based that you had even ten years ago, but certainly thirty or forty or fifty years ago. Um, uh, it, it, possibly you did, wouldn't need um, descriptive representation. But now that those other f forms of producing the substantive representation of workers' interests are actually falling by the wayside, you might want to have some descriptive representation just to get the interests in on the deliberative floor. Um, so that's what I said in that article. And that's at the lawmaking level. And I think that a lot of these considerations apply at the point of application of coercion as well. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think another reason. Uh, another a little good, louder, because I'm deaf. Another good um, facet of using coercion in that term for what you're talking about is precisely sort of at the heart of the free writer problem itself, right? You're trying to encourage people to get comfortable with the idea that they have to pay costs, right, for right. certain goods, namely these public goods, right? Um, and so saying they should, like the case for coercion abroad, you're trying to get people more comfortable mm -hmm. with the idea that they have to pay certain costs for public yeah, goods. Yeah, not just have pay certain costs, but be forced to pay them. Right, exactly. And that, that's sort of, that's ground rules for right. having these things work. Yes. Um, and so I like, I very much like that aspect of the talk. I think the thing that I'd like to hear a little bit more on is usually people will buy into that or say it's okay if they all accept the end, right? If, or if, if they, they all accept the outcome. Of, if they right? like the outcome. If the, if the benefit, right, is something that they're willing to right. accept for this right. course of that. Right. Right. And so it seems to me that the content of legitimacy, and specifically something like substantive legitimacy or what you're calling justice here, really makes a difference, um, both in terms of what's in there, right, for, make, for making this argument on what, when we can put transparency on the sidelines, when we can sort of be more coercive or less coercive, right? Um, and it also um, is important to discuss because it seems like there is really what, what's at the heart of a lot of disagreement in American politics, right, is how you interpret the ends of, the appropriate ends, of legitimate ends of justice of government, right? So um, I wonder if there, if you can either say more about that or if there's other work you're doing that sort of goes through that laundry list of complex legitimacy for sort of procedures, right, that make the government legitimate, but then also what you do on the substantive front. Right. Um, I'm sort of focusing on the procedure because, um, not because I think it's the only thing, it's because it's what I'm best at understanding, um, but also because it's um, when you have substantive, deep, deep substantive disagreements, including disagreements about justice, if you have a procedure that you think is legitimate, you can often live with losing on your, on your preferred outcome mm -hmm. and even on the outcome you think is just. Uh, you know, even if you think it's an unjust outcome. Mm -hmm. If you think that the procedures are fair, and you can go out there in the streets, and you can protest, and you can make the case in the newspapers, and you can get a hearing, and you can, you know, the, the, the newspapers have not been bought up by the, you know, by the opposite side, and so forth. <coughs> if, you, if, you if, if you think the procedure is fair, um, and especially in a, I mean, one of the sort of beauties of a democracy is that, um, you, you, if it, you know, if it were to be ideal, which it's very far from ideal, but if it were closer to the ideal, the more you sort of blame your other citizens. You know, your neighbor, you just, you, your neighbor is screwed up. There are for an unjust outcome. Um, and, but then that becomes your job to kind of convince your neighbor that, but it's your neighbor that's, 
It's, it's, it's the citizenry. And that, has, that does lots of things. It, 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 it helps legitimate the outcome. Um, and it also gives you a, a place to go. The place to go is you change your neighbor's mind. How do you change your neighbor's mind? How do you get them to see the thing the correct way, namely your way? Um, and maybe they'll, of course, convince you that they're right. But, but you, it gives you a place. It not only legitimates the thing that you don't like, and not only do you not like it, you think it's unjust, mm -hmm. but it gives you a place to go. And the more you think that the system is just really illegitimate, that you know that the, the the ABC group of people are, are just coming in here and through their money or whatever it might be and just running it, <clears throat> um, then it's neither legitimate nor do you have a place to go, and that's when the injustice really, 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 really hurts because you don't have anything to that you any 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 way you can change it. Well, just as an empirical question. Do you think most people evaluate legitimacy by process or by outcome? I mean, I think that most people evaluate legitimacy by outcome, and that's combined with um, not being very political, not paying a lot of attention, yeah. well, as opposed to by process. So while maybe that the philosopher feels what you said, as I do, that if you if if people evaluated legitimacy by process grounds, they could live with losing more easily. The fact is that historically you get stable systems where people are pretty happy with the outcomes, or they feel so disempowered they can't do anything about it, as opposed to actually care that much about it. So in, in Denmark, people are really happy with the outcomes. That's, that's... Yeah. So I have two things to say about that. One is that we should you know, the, from the philosophical point of view, be more aware of outcomes. And I remember sitting with a friend, Kathy Newman, as a matter of fact, at lunch at one point, and she said, well, if that's the outcome, I'd like to hear about the process. And what she meant by that, this was just apropos of some internal university <laughs> thing, but I noticed it because I thought it was a philosophical clue that if you consistently get a good, a lousy outcomes from a process, that's a bit of a, Bing, bing, you know, that's a little bit of a, of a clue to go back and look at the process. Maybe, maybe something's wrong with the process that keeps producing terrible outcomes. Yeah. So, um, so that, you know, just simply saying, ah, oh, the process. No, you, you, it, this is a, a two-way street. You could, could criticize the process from the point of view of the outcome, as well as, as, as having the, outcome, the process legitimate a bad uh, an outcome you don't like. So that's thing one. Second thing is, um, yeah. Absolutely, and so when um, the, so when I was in China, um, which China obviously gets its legitimacy, and it's a very legitimate, you know, quite, quite legitimate regime from the point of view of, of the perceived legitimacy, um, not the lower levels, uh, but the top, the Be Beijing is is really perceived as quite legitimate by many, many, many big people in, in China. You know, democracy, democracy. You know, that's this producing an outcome. Um, and so, this young man, we had, I had tea with some students after a lecture, and this young man was sitting next to me. He said, "Well, why should we have democracy?" And it's so funny. It's wonderful to like go, go leave your country, because I felt as if that question. I studied democracy. I've studied democracy for. 40 years, whatever, I felt that that question was coming on me fresh, like a sunrise, you know, just absolutely clean. Why should we have democracy? Well, I have to say, looking at Singapore on that chart, you could ask that about Singapore. <laughs> so I, I, there were two teacups, and I said, well, let's imagine you have country A and country B, and they're both, one of them has legitimacy that comes from output, and one comes from process, and also process. And the other one just from output, and um, output goes down because you know life is not constant, always up, up, up. There happen to be sometimes some downs. Which do you think will be better off? The one that that has at the same time it's got both legitimacy from output and a legitimate process, and the one that just is relying on the output, and that's why you have democracy. Is is because um, it's, there's something else there, that, you know, mm -hmm. like if it's unjust, 
or if you know if, if you're having a depression or, or whatever if you think that the sort of the government's doing you know it's a legitimate thing and you know we're, it's it's us kind of we are doing the best we can then we'll try to ride this one out you know and now of course if it's terrible 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 for a very long time then you begin to say heck hey, if that's the output let's take a look at this process maybe there's some pretty da bad process going on anyway Look, isn't that beautiful? Look at Eric against that. Uh, isn't that gorgeous? You guys just have the most beautiful place.